I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. My name is Reverend Dale Brown, and I get to be the senior pastor of Community Church at Ocean Pines. As you all who might watch us regularly know, my buddy Ted Page is here. Ted, good morning to you, sir. We're filming this in the morning, and Ted is my silent partner. He likes to be behind the camera, just not in front of it. I welcome you on this day as we worship together and we consider one of the great parables of the New Testament. That parable is the parable of the sower. So let's pray together and begin our worship. God of abundant love, we come to you this day in the midst of a season of great growth and coming harvest. All around us are signs of growth. Our earth, our nation, our world, ourselves are all in need of growth. We come this day seeking your healing love and abounding mercy. Open our hearts to receive all that you offer, that we may become fruitful workers for you. Amen. Dear friends, let us hear the word of God as it is found for us, the parable of the sower, in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. When a great crowd gathered, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed some which fell on the path, and was trampled, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, that anyone with ears to hear, listen. Dear friends, this is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Parables are my favorite form of literature in the New Testament. Jesus tells many, many parables in what we call the Synoptic Gospels, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not have any parables. In fact, it has these I am statements of Jesus, which reveal the character of Christ in a way that the parables reveal it in other places. And there are some great wonderful parables. If I said to you a certain man left Jerusalem and on his, was on his way to Jericho and fell among thieves, you would know that I was talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan. If I said to you a certain man had two sons, you know that I would be talking about the parable of the lost sons or the great wonderful father. And so today we come to one where it says a certain farmer went out to sow seed. And we understand this to be the parable of the sower. Now I have to make a confession to you. When I was a young pastor many years ago, and when I preached this parable many years ago, I preached it all wrong. And let me explain that. I would preach something like, what kind of soil are you? Are you the soil that's the path? And when the seed of the word of God falls on the path, the, the birds come and, and eat it up and it's gone quickly. Or are you the seed that fell, are you the soil like the rocky soil and, and, uh, you know, because there's no moisture there, it dries up and dies. Or 
Are you the thorny soil that, you know, when the seed falls there, it shoots up a little bit, but the cares and concerns of the world choke it out and it dies? Or are you good soil? And that good soil allows for a great harvest. And I would ask you, you know, what kind of soil are you? But then through some further study, I found that maybe that's not the best interpretation. Now, I think I took that interpretation because if you keep reading in Luke 8 and in the other places where this parable is in the Bible, you'll see an allegorical interpretation of the very different aspects of the story. It's the only one like it in the entire New Testament. But I think the real emphasis of the story is not on the soil, which can only be changed by fertilizer. But the real emphasis of this story is on the sower, not the soil. The soil may very well represent us and our hearts and our receptivity to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus Christ, but the parable talks about a farmer. Now I've grown up here most and lived most of my life on the eastern shore of Maryland or in the state of Delaware. And I have believed that, you know, farming is an honorable and wonderful profession. It's hard work. And that our farm families are a great asset to us. And, you know, I still believe that. I still like riding by and looking at farmland. When I was in Kent County, Delaware, I would go with the uh, different ones to some of these farm tours. And I learned so much about farming and how different it is now than when my father farmed briefly many, many years ago. Dad learned he was a good banker and a poor farmer. This farmer is unlike any farmer that I've ever heard of. When I look at farms here on the eastern shore of Maryland in Worcester County, those rows are perfectly straight. And it's done with a tractor, with GPS, and you know, you, you, you do that work so that everything is laid out almost to perfection. But not so the sower in the story of Jesus tells us. He goes out and, and he sows seed. But he does so in a way that as my dad used to say, was willy-nilly. He's just throwing seed everywhere. He's not concentrating it on the soil where there's the greatest chance for response. He's throwing it on the path. He's throwing it in the rocky soil. He's throwing it in the thorny soil. And he's throwing it in the good soil. All of them receive some seed from the sower. It seems illogical, doesn't it? You would think that he would put that seed carefully where it has the greatest chance of growing and of producing a harvest. Where the greatest chance is that the right nutrients and the right amount of water and the right amount of sunlight would make for that soil and that seed a great harvest. And sometimes that happens. But the sower still sows on the path in the rocky soil and in the thorny soil. What is this parable telling us today? Having said that the parable is really about the sower, the sower is God. And God's love is sown in all kinds of places. Sometimes on the path where the birds of the air come and eat it up. God's love is sown there. Sometimes God's love is sown in the rocky soil where there's not moisture and the right nutrients and the right things, but it's still sown there. Sometimes God's love is sown in the places where the thorny soil and the, the other plants there grow up and take from that soil the nutrients and the, the things that need and choke out the life. And sometimes God's love is sown in 
good soil and it produces significant response. God's love is extravagant. God is not a Scrooge with a miserly amount of love watching to catch us or to trap us in some wrongdoing. God wants everyone to respond and so that seed is sown everywhere. It's like grabbing it out of the bag of seed and just broadcasting it. Because here's the great thing about this. Some of the seed on the path won't respond, but some will. And some of the seed in the rocky soil won't respond. There's not the right nutrients, but some will. Some of the seed that's sown on the soil with thorns and other plants won't respond, but some will. And the good seed, and the soil, the seed that's thrown in the good soil, that's just a blessing upon blessing upon blessing. So we come back to asking and talking about soil, about the seed, about the sower. God's love is extravagant. God is a risky God of love who will love people that we as a society might say are unlovable, are outside the spectrum of good people, maybe don't fit all the categories, but they're God's people and God loves them. And that's great because if God loves them, God loves us, and vice versa as well. Let me tell you just a couple of experiences of this. I had great respect for the bishops of my church, the United Methodist Church, and one of those bishops that I had the privilege of knowing and working with was Bishop Peter D. Weaver. And Bishop Weaver wanted us as clergy to be out in the streets and giving witness and inviting people to faith in Christ and to encourage them to, to, to respond faithfully to the seed that is sown. And so we would canvas towns and we would give witness and we would invite people to come to the United Methodist Church. And one of those days, and I think it might have been in the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference, Bishop Weaver was a part of a team of canvassing persons and he went into a bar simply to invite people to come to church. And he went up to a man who was sitting at the bar and he wasn't drinking to excess, he was you know, doing what people do and Bishop Weaver said to him, hey, how are you? And greeted him and welcomed him and established a little bit of a relationship with him and the conversation came down to this. Bishop Weaver said to him something like, have you ever thought about going to church? And the man said, yeah, I go to church every Sunday. And Bishop Weaver said, well, you know, I'm a United Methodist. And the man said, you know what, I'm a United Methodist too. And he reached down and pulled up his pant leg and there tattooed on his leg was our church symbol, the cross and the flame. You never know where the seed will sprout. Think of the prodigal son. The New Testament tells us when he came to his senses, he went back home and he begged his father's forgiveness. And that way of talking about people, the prodigal has come to remind us of people who have gone far, far away from God Maybe they're the path, maybe they're the rocky soil, maybe they're the thorny soil. But they still have the chance to come back to God. Look at the disciples that Jesus called. Fishermen called the sons of thunder. Now, my image of the sons of thunder growing up here is of guys who wore a lot of camouflage. They had great big trucks with great big tires tires and trucks so tall and so high that you'd have to help me to get in. They had blacked out windows on their truck. They had a gun rack in the back. 
They always had mud guards on their tires in front of their trucks, and their trucks always seemed to be have been just out of the field. And the music they played was country music, and they played it very, very loud. So loud that when they drove by your house, you could hear every word of what they were listening to. That's the image I have of the Sons of Thunder. They were disciples, important disciples of Jesus. Jesus called tax collectors. Matthew and we little Zacchaeus. Jesus embraced the leper. He sat down with a woman at the well. He wrote in sand for the woman caught in adultery. Over and over and over again, Jesus has a relationship with people whose lives have grown up from and in different kinds of soil. I don't know where you are in your faith journey right now. Maybe you're on the path, that path where the birds come and eat it. Maybe you're in that rocky soil where there doesn't seem to be the nutrients and the moisture that's needed and it's hard. Maybe you're in that thorny soil. Wherever you are, you need to know that the sower who has extravagantly sown seed loves you, cares about you, that Jesus thinks you are a person of merit and value, that God's love for us as humanity, as people, is extravagant. I love serving a God who loves extravagantly because that gives me permission to love extravagantly as well. How dare I as a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ hold tightly and squeeze the last drop out of God's love when God never did that God's self. God loved and loves extravagantly. There are all kinds of people today in our world who don't quite fit. Maybe we don't quite fit. But God's love is extended to them. Whether you're homeless or hungry, unemployed, or maybe even if you're the richest person around town, God's love covers you. No one of us is beyond the reach of God's love. So this parable, like all the parables, I think ultimately, is not so much about us. It's not about five easy ways to follow Christ. It's about God. It's about the sower. And it's not an easy path because God calls us to love and to love extravagantly and to not say, oh, I can love everyone but this person or that person or the other person or this group. I don't like those persons. I don't like the way they look. I fear them so I don't have to love them. In God's understanding of kingdom, everyone is welcome. And Jesus died for all. The limitations that are placed upon God's love are placed there by ourselves, not by God. And we need to own up and understand that. That it's our own lives, our own fears, our own biases that limit God, not the other way around. Even those persons who are far from God were called to love in the name of Jesus Christ. I find it great and wonderful and awesome that we serve a God who loves extravagantly. But it also requires a lot out of me. It requires me to set aside my own agenda, my own wishes, my own thoughts, my own ideas, and to look and to listen for God in very surprising places and from very surprising people. No one is beyond the reach of God's love. Not you, not me, not anyone. Because of that, it is good news to us. 
So thank you for joining us. For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the different parables of Jesus. Some of them you probably will recognize right away. Others of them might be new to you. But I am reminded that the parables have a sense of irony about them. That they call us to look beyond the limitations of our own thinking and to be open to seeing and hearing from God in new ways. And today, I think that way is to experience a fresh and a new and to share with others the extravagant love of God. If you would stand if you're able and sing with us, uh, How Great Thou Art, followed by Amazing Grace. God, we have gathered together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your words scattered among us this morning, this day, fall on fertile, fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen.
Dear friends, go in peace and may the love of God bless you and keep you every day, every moment you live. Amen.